Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome to this evening's webinar entitled Connecting with the Collection. I'd like to extend out my gratitude and thanks to all of you for being with us today, tonight. My name is Patrick Chisholm. And I am the collections officer at here at the Osgoode Township Museum. So the Osgoode Township Museum acknowledges that our museum located in Vernon, Ontario, just south of Ottawa, is on the traditional unceded ancestral land of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people. Algonquin and Anishinaabeg are the original inhabitants of this territory along the Ottawa River. Rideau and Castor Rivers, and I have lived on this land since time immemorial. We are grateful to have the opportunity to be present in this territory. So this evening's talk is on the topic of collections management. It is intended to give you a glimpse into what we do in collections management and how it works in a community museum. Examples of topics that we'll be discussing tonight We'll specifically go into what happens when an object enters into the museum, how do objects become artifacts, and how artifacts are then used within the permanent collection. After that, I'll connect with the Osgoode Township Museum collection and highlight some amazing artifacts. I'll then uh, show a video of a quick tour, uh, and, I'll be a, and I'll, we will be asking you, the viewer, to participate and provide feedback uh, on some of the prepared activities that we have in store for you tonight. If you are able to, please engage with us. We hope to provide you with an enjoyable and informative experience. And for all those that uh, would prefer to just sit back and watch and take it all in, that's totally fine and, and good with us too. So let's dive into it and begin presenting Osgoode Township Museum's collect, Connecting with the Collection. So I'll start by introducing the Osgoode Township Museum site, collection, and some of the history of the museum. I'll then give a brief introduction to myself, my hometown, education, and professional experience. I'll then, of course, talk about museums, the, the main topic that we're all here to discuss which will cover what is the main purpose of a museum and what is the difference between a, a museum and a community setting. What's different about that? The life cycle of artifacts. So how, here we will explain what it, that means in the context of a museum. And I will dive a bit deeper into the stories and life cycle information, also known as, as, also known as provenance of artifacts, how it connects to the museum and why we take that information and present it to the public. So artifacts to highlight, I'll highlight four artifacts from the permanent collection. And these artifacts will help to represent our theme on the life cycle of objects for tonight's talk. Uh, following that, I'll do the behind the scenes recorded tour. And then uh, we will launch interactive activities through the website Nearpod. Uh, after that, you know, we'll be asking you to participate in some of those activities. And we will provide in the next step instructions when we get there, but just a forewarning that in order to participate in these activities, you will need to open an additional browser. Uh, and then uh, that in, in, a, in addition to the one that you're currently using for Zoom. Following that, and at the end of the presentation, I will, we will conduct a 15 minute question and answer session for you to make comments and ask questions. Okay, before we begin the next part of the presentation, I'd also like to note that I am joined here tonight by other representatives of the museum. My colleagues, Caitlin McDougall, Education Officer, and Jillian Metcalf, Executive Director, will be following along and assisting with moderating the Q&A chat box and also helping me with the camera work and any technical difficulties that may arise. I'd also like to take this opportunity to note that we are accepting questions in the Zoom chat box as we go through the presentation and we'll make every effort to answer them either directly in the chat box or at the end during the Q&A and they will be brought to my attention. I can speak to them directly. However, if we are not able to get to your question tonight, we will ensure to reconnect with you in the future and I would be happy to answer your question then. My email will be listed on the final slide of the presentation, but it's patrick at osgoodmuseum.ca. 
also, just to let you know, tonight's presentation is being recorded just to make you all aware of that. Finally, we have a budgeted, we have budgeted about an hour's time for tonight's talk, but given some of the plans that we have in place, it's hard to exactly predict uh, when we when we will be done, but uh, we potentially could exceed that. I just wanted to take a moment to be cognizant of everyone's time. Alrighty, so without any further housekeeping items, let's begin tonight's presentation. So the Osgoode Township Museum is located in the community of Vernon, Ontario, just south of Ottawa, and has been operating as a museum since 1973. The Osgoode Township Museum tells the story of Ottawa's agricultural and rural heritage with a focus on, with a focus on um, agriculture in the former Osgoode Township. Here you have a photographic view of the main museum sign in sight from Bank Street. The main museum building previously served as a public school. On August 8th, 1973, the museum's founding group signed an agreement with the Township of Osgoode to repurpose the building formerly known as Vernon Public School. Here's a shot of uh, the class. If you visit the Osgoode Township Museum during the spring, summer, or fall, you'll get the chance to wander around the grounds and marvel at the 10,000 square foot heritage garden that is modeled after a 1907 school garden orchard. The museum is fortunate to have a fabulous dedicated group of volunteers that tend to the garden and grow everything on site. From all types of fruits and vegetables to herbs and flowers, the Osgoode Township Museum's Heritage Garden has it all. Here's a photo of the Heritage Garden from the roof of the museum in the summer of 2020. Here's a photo of the grounds behind the museum, which was also taken from the roof in the summer of 2020, just to give you a, a sense of the scale, the size of the, the, the property. Here you have a nice graphic map of the entire museum site from Bank Street in to the back of the property. So the main museum building houses an eclectic collection of approximately 10,000 artifacts. This means that the collection is composed of various types of objects that are drawn from multiple sources. The artifacts in the collection range from 3D objects like everyday household items, such as a potato masher, to decorative items like framed hair wreaths. To date, the Osgoode Township Museum's permanent collection is currently numbered at approximately 10,882 artifacts with 16 ongoing potential accessions. This includes countless examples of documents, photographs, artwork, uniforms, clothing, memorabilia, textiles, etc. Here you see examples of collection storage shelves and, air and artifacts that are stored in the permanent collection. Inside the museum, the brand new permanent exhibition first launched in December of 2020 and entitled Rooted in Rural, cultivating connections displays the community of displays the community story of the township and its people from its early beginnings to present day this photograph shows an area within the newly launched gallery space the dugout canoe pictured here on display is two feet two inches wide by 16 feet six inches long it's almost 17 feet long it's a very large canoe at Osgoode Township Museum, there are two exhibition spaces, two main exhibition spaces, the inside gallery, which you just saw a glimpse of, and the outside Agricultural Museum building. The Agricultural Museum building was first built and officially opened on August 12th, 1989. And here is a photograph from that day that shows the official opening and ribbon cutting from inside the Agricultural Museum. Listed on the back of the, uh, the print are the names of the people that were present for that. And a lot of, uh, as you can see, a lot of politicians were there. Inside the Agricultural Museum barn, it provides a home for the vast farming and industrial collection held by held by the museum, which includes full-size tractors, plows, combines, as well as handheld farming tools and industrial equipment. This tractor is a circa 1950s International Harvester McCormack 
Farm Owl Super A tractor and is on display in the agricultural barn. It measures approximately nine feet long by five feet wide. So for myself, I was born and raised in Sault Ste. Marie, smack down and right in the middle of the Great Lakes. I am a graduate of the Applied Museum Studies program at Algonquin College of 2018. And I have had uh, various uh, museum work experiences in the field of in the National Capital Region. So for example, the National Gallery of Canada, I worked for the Technical Services Department. And you can see a photograph here in the top left corner in the National Gallery. Ingenium Science and Tech Museum, I worked in the archives division. So this photograph here on the top right shows me inside the cold storage uh, freezer doing uh, moving some film reels for a project. The two photographs below are from the Goldburn Museum where I'm doing collections care and also installing an exhibit. And of course, I, I first started as Osgood Township Museum in August of 2020 and I've been been here ever since. So now we have a, a Zoom poll for all of you on your current knowledge of collections management. Oh, I just launched it. I'll give you a few moments to All right, let's look and I will be able to share the results with you guys as, as well momentarily. We got a variety here, it looks like people from all different walks knowledge. All right, any more? Yeah, a couple more. That's awesome. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. A couple more? No? All right. So as you can see here, uh, it's all pretty varied. So I'm speaking to a, a varied audience in terms of your knowledge. That's, that's good. Thanks for, thanks for the feedback. All right. So what is the main purpose of a museum? It's a permanent institutional fixture that exists to preserve the history of the scope and the area defined in the museum's mandate, collections, policies, mission statement, or vision. The museum wants to study and research artifacts in the collection, and they want to share that information and make it available to the public. Ultimately, you want to research, interpret, and document that information in the collection. You want to provide educational programs and activities to the public and events, and you want to engage with the public as much as possible. So community museums are mandated to collect objects that specifically relate to the community's history that they operate in. In comparison, national museums typically adhere to a much broader scale as discussed in the 1990s Museums Act, which pertains to Crown Corporation institutions. The National Museum's broader context typically re relates to an entire country or a nation. How do they position themselves to share that knowledge on a more global stage? And that's what their focus is, I think, more, of it, more often. The objects in a community museum collection may have some direct or some sort of indirect connection to the community that the museum resides in. For example, the person who owned the object lived in the area, the person who owned and used the object within the geographic location of the community, and items that were made within the township. This is generally a stark difference between a national museum and a community museum. National museums typically have internal departments that each handle the main functions of the museum. Collections, exhibitions, research, programming, events, social media, communications, in a community museum, staff may have a job description and a primary responsibility, but ultimately in a community museum setting, typically all permanent staff support and work in all functions of the museum. We do it all. So what does a museum collect? What will the institution collect? The possibilities are really endless. 
as technically and arguably the museum could collect anything that could potentially pertain to the museum mandate and collections policies, a community museum must thoroughly assess all potential acquisitions, but it could be anything from a tangible 3D object, such as items like a photographic print, paper document, watercolored painting, frame certificate, or farming hand tool to other intangible items like digital forms or files that contain audio or video. However, when we really think of a museum artifact collection, we tend to think of something that you can physically hold in your hand, but it's not always the case. This is why it is so important to write and create easy to read and understand policies and statements that support the museum's overall purpose. This is also why it is important for a museum to collect all of the important life cycle and contextual information about the object that they are looking to acquire, loan, or have donated. Artifacts pictured here, the January 3rd, 1881 Osgoode Township Museum voting ballot, the Sons of the Motherland uh, postcard featuring four military soldiers, soldiers left to right, Australia, Australia, Britain, Canada, and South Africa. And then the 1914-1918 World War I Allied Nations handkerchief. It's an embroidered beige linen handkerchief with words and the music for the song. It's a long, long way to Tipperary, sung by John McCormack from 1915. The music sheet is flanked by the flags of worldwide World War I Allied Nations, Japan, Britain, Russia, France, and what we believe to be a faded Belgium flag. The outside border is shamrocks enclosing flags and Victoria crosses. And all three of these objects are on display and included in the Osgoode Township Museum's permanent exhibit. Ultimately, running and following ethical practices in how you operate the museum and run the collections are really at the root of it all. There are many resources and guidelines out there for a community museum to follow. And one to look at is the Provincial Community Standard for Museums that was created by the Ontario Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sport. At the end of the day, everything that the museum does must be clearly defined and thoroughly followed through policy. You see examples of that here. Museums use the accessioning and deaccessioning process to effectively add or remove objects from the permanent collection. For the purposes of today's talk, I will just be discussing those two means as a way for the community museum to add to its collection. That is to say that there are other ways, situations and circumstances that may arise where a museum adds to the collection, but I will not be going into those specific details tonight. One thing that will never change, the parameters of how a museum collects and what the museum will collect. A museum can set its own priorities for objects or errors to identify and collect from. And this will be clearly defined and laid out in a collection development policy or procedure. Ultimately, the museum's mandate will determine whether an object is up for an acquisition or removal. And as you can see, this is the Osgoode Township Museum's mandate. There are other determining factors that may go into the, the de decision making for when a museum is considering adding to the collection. For example, a curatorial proposal or a justification may be written, or another form of assessment process may be followed to determine an ob object's overall suitability within the collection. The Osgoode Township Museum uses a weighted criteria system that impartially assesses an object in a given potential acquisition and assigns a numerical rating to it based on a variety of factors or criteria. This weighted criteria assessment is then provided to the museum's ass artifact assessment committee, which is made up of members of the community, for final approval to either accept or deny objects into the collection. The museum must always look to identify and assess its current collections in comparison with anything that's looking to be acquired. Ultimately, an, an ideal potential acquisition or accession is when the overall life cycle information of the objects looking to be donated are well documented and known by the donor.
specific contextual information related to the relating to the object's origins and its history is vitally important for the museum to know and document in its records. Documenting an object's life cycle information will greatly add or benefit its overall historical interpretation and significance that can then be shared with the public. So artifacts that are pictured here, a 1976 NHL All-Star jersey worn by Larry Robinson in the All-Star game against Russia, a 1827 land deed parchment for lots in Osgoode Township, a 1970 to 1980 Orville Prophet laminated poster, and a 1914 to 1918 Dead Man's Penny given to the next kin of soldiers for soldiers that fell during an action during World War I. And in this case is Forrest Allen Knowles's. All of these objects are also included in the Osgoode Township Museum's permitted exhibit. So documenting the collection. How does the museum document the collection? It does so with catalog records and a categorized collections management system. The system is typically a database or a computer software that stores all of the information that it, the museum has on any given object in the collection. It should also be noted that catalog records at one point would have been all paper-based. The Osgoode Township Museum uses Manisys, which is hosted externally with the City of Ottawa Museums and Archives collection on the OMAC website, which is publicly available. And Past Perfect, hosted internally on site on a server at the museum. Interesting to note, the photograph showing a threshing mill here, that threshing mill is actually in the Osgood Township Museum collection and currently stored in the agricultural barn. Other artifacts that are pictured here is a chief petty officer hat, from circa 1945 and a signed Larry Robinson hockey player portrait from pro his professional hockey days with the Nova Scotia Voyagers, affiliate of the, no of the Montreal Canadiens. Larry was there for two seasons playing from 1971 to 1973. So here is a, is a view of what a cataloged Manisys record looks like. And this is for a 1907 Metcalf hockey club photograph. Here is a view of the Osgoode Township Museum's main title page on Past Perfect, on the Past Perfect collections management software. So this would be the, the initial page that you would see when you sign into the software. Putting it into context, knowing what's in the collection. Knowing what you have in the collection and documenting that information is vital for the institutional knowledge and artifact research that is collected by the museum. For example, we have two items in the collection. One of the objects is a typical wall-mounted clock and is a great example of clocks used in the early 20th century, but we have no documented history to share about its origins, where it was from, and who owned it. All we know is when it entered into the museum and it was located in the museum collection. This is represented by the object's accession number. The other object is a lantern from a farm in the community. We know where it was from, who owned it, and as you can see, we actually have a photograph of the original owner using the lantern on a steam tractor on their property. Two very different circumstances to show how the importance of documenting the history of an object that is destined for a museum collection and how important and how that information is then provided to the museum and then reinterpreted and shared with the public. So what's an accession number? An accession number is a unique number that is assigned to a museum object when, they are, when it is officially acquired into the museum's permanent collection. It is assigned to the object for the purposes of tracking and documented its collected information in a, into a cataloged record. Most museums use the three number trinomial system the Osgoode Township Museum uses the three-digit trinomial sequence system for accession numbers of objects in the collection. For example, 2015.16.01 refers to the year it was acquired, 2015. 16 is the lot number for the number of lotted accessions in a given year. And the 01 represents the object number from that specific lotted accession. 
So 2015, that accession number is actually a silver Rose Bowl trophy that was awarded to James Earl Wynn of the County Championship Cheese uh, Competition. And I guess it was uh, sponsored by Lord Elgin Hotel. And as you can see, there's some really beautiful grapes along the rim and there's a floral design on the base of the bowl. This object entered in the collection on, uh, on 20, in 2015, June, June 25th, 2015. Artifact attributes. So what do we really look for in an artifact? It's relevance. Does this object enhance our mandate? How does it pertain to the Osgood story? Is it Osgood centric in any way? Provenance, it's history and documentation. How or what do we know about its life cycle before it arrived on site? Do we have any corresponding items that relate to it? Condition. Does it require treatment? If we accept an accession it into the collection, is it going to require a conservation treatment from a trained conservator before it is safe to be put on display or to store it? Or is it safe to be uh, stored around other objects? Interpretive potential. Does it have a story to tell? How can we interpret that information that it provides us and then turn around and reinterpret it for the public to view? Duplication. Do we already have that same object in the collection? We need to constantly assess and identify duplications in the collection. Cost, associated costs with acquisition. Uncommon, but it does happen. Typically, a small community museum does not have a budget or the resources to seek out acquisitional items to buy or purchase. The national museums and other bigger institutions do have those resources. So, as a community museum, we really do depend on support from the community through public donations. Space. Can we accommodate it? Size. Such a big thing. Interesting fact, too. It is fairly standard across most museums that exist with a permanent collection that those institutions only are able to show a small percentage of their collection on display. The majority of it unfortunately stays in storage and it may be highly unlikely that those objects are ever put out on display. A potential advantage here for a community museum, arguably, is that we have added flexibility to invite visitors to see and to see those areas and show off some of those collection storage areas. We have the ability to do so at any time to give people a behind the scenes per perspective of how things work in a collection storage and work areas. Repatriation. Did we consult with local Indigenous communities? We do not want to collect items that may be more suitable in another institution or organization. And we always need to be cognizant of what is in our collection. Safety. Does it pose a risk or a hazard to the person that's handling it? Does it pose a risk to somebody else that would handle it? Or do, does it pose a risk to another object? Does it have something harmful in it, like asbestos, arsenic? Uh, you know, objects that maybe have some kind of fluid that ha have an environmental issue that could cause something. So you certainly have to watch out for that. Legal, proof of ownership. Is the potential donor the unequivocal owner of the items that are legally signing over ownership of those objects that they are donating to the museum? Typically, they cannot be returned once they are accessioned into the collection. And banned items, I really mean just different types of arms and ammunitions that exist that could be banned. And you always need somebody with a firearms license to handle and safely store those restricted items. And the RCMP would uh, oversee all of that, of course. Collections management essentials. So I've really broken it down into four main categories, conservation, documentation, or cataloging acquisitions and movement. So storage and preventive conservation. How do we care and for and monitor the spaces that the artifacts reside in? What types of materials are safe to use and be stored with the artifacts? What agents of deterioration do we need to watch out for to ensure we preserve our collections for as long as possible? And for those of you that may not know what an agent of deterioration is, 
It is essentially any force that contributes to the damage and further degradation of objects. So for example, incorrect temperature would be an agent of deterioration. Cataloging and photo documentation. So how can I document this artifact and store its information in our database? Am I gonna take photographs that are up to museum industry standards? Do I wanna digitize the collection and increase the digital footprint of the museum? And of course, that's a big focus for all institution nowadays with the pandemic to offer more accessibility and awareness of the collections through a digital means. Acquisitions and uses in the collection. So of course that goes back to donor correspondence, uh, making sure that we're documenting all that information justifying and assess, assessing an acquisition prior to accepting and accessioning it. And then deaccessioning is at the end of the artifacts life cycle. It's essentially removing artifacts that do not belong in the collection and should be removed due to its condition, lack of connection to the community or to the mandate. And there are some other uh, factors in there as well. But ultimately deaccessioning is a long process. Objects must be first offered to other institutions before any thought of disposal. And movement, of course, moving the objects within the collection for means of research, loans, exhibitions, programming, events, media, communications. So there's lots of reasons why you would move objects within the collection. All right, collections management challenges. So I'm going to go through this quickly. Variation in and out uh, and or dissociated accession number. So that, access, that essentially means uh, you have an object that was written or you have an accession number that was written onto an object and it was lost or it, it was somehow misplaced. Mystery, uncatalogued or found in collection items. So uh, that really goes back to you know, something that hasn't been properly accessioned don't really have much information on it. And I, again, no number, no paperwork, life cycle or donation information really goes back to just not having enough documented information on, on that object. Same with the lack of donor information. Um, so again, it just really goes back to there's never enough time with collections. There's, there's always something that's going on and uh, there's always something to, there's always challenges to, to, to you know, think about. And of course, sometimes these are inherited challenges as well that are inherited from previous uh, work that was done in the museum. But we must keep in mind other duties as required in a community museum. It's the reality of the day-to-day -day operations. So I'm, I may be asked to do collections, but another day I may be asked to do exhibitions or programming. Often a lot of these potential challenges are, are inherited, as I mentioned. You always want to plan for a smooth transitional period, but sometimes that's not always the case, as we know. And again, there's just there's never enough time with collections. There's there's always something to do. So collections management, ongoing projects, uh, cataloging new acquisitions, updating existing records, adding images to the records, editing research information and ongoing knowledge and the ongoing knowledge of the artifacts in the collection. You want to continue to make records public and available online. You want to cross-reference our findings with the paper donation records because those paper donation records are vitally important and essentially give us ownership of those objects. And the artifact movements, as I mentioned, condition and object reporting. So that's a technical reporting on what is found on the object, the condition and, and basically how it looks. Prevented conservation efforts. Um, so that goes into environmental monitoring. So you want to monitor your spaces that you hold artifacts for relative humidity and temperature. And you also want to use integrated pest management systems to protect, protect your objects from insects and pests. Protecting objects from direct sunlight as well and, and ultraviolet radiation. That's a, that's a big uh, damage for, for objects. And then of course, potential donation correspondence corresponding with the donors and understanding what they would like to donate and then also communicating our process to them and how that works. So life cycle of artifacts. 
Speaking directly to one of the main themes of today's presentation, the life cycle of artifacts generally refers to the time that the objects was first manufactured and made to the time it was used by someone who has a connection to the local area to the time that it enters into the museum collection to what the museum uses it for and then what happens to it at the end of its life cycle when the museum is no longer a suitable place for it to keep the object. Over the course of this life cycle process, there are numerous people that have interacted or come into contact with the object throughout its life before it enters into the museum. And of course, the museum would be interested in every story and narrative about an object that enters into the museum, enter in, into its museum and potentially its permanent collection. A community museum is typically a not-for-profit organization and therefore to remain operational and mostly publicly funded. So one reason that a museum wants to know every story and narrative about its holdings is because all of the objects that are accepted in, and entered into the collection are held in public trust and in perpetuity. This means forever, or at the very least until the very end of the life cycle and the museum can no longer get any educational research or historic value from the object or item. To briefly speak to the objects that are pictured here from the collection, the wooden rooster is a carved painting. The framed winter landscape is an acrylic color painting on canvas. And the 1870 Fenian Raids Medal awarded to Private McCosty. A photograph of school teacher and principal of Vernon Continuation School, Rebecca Stenhouse. And a photograph of the 19, winter 1943 Osgood train station. The 1870 Fenian Raids Medal and the 1943 train station photograph are included in the Osgood Township Museum's permanent exhibit. All right, uh, highlighted artifacts. So donated this dugout canoe was donated to the museum in July 1991 by Lorne Craig, a local resident. The canoe was initially displayed in the agricultural barn, which you can see here, that's where it was initially stored. The accessioning information documented its life cycle history before arriving on site at the museum. This beautifully constructed 17 foot dugout canoe made from a single pine log by Alex Kennedy and Sam Craig of Vernon in about 1890 was used on the Castor, Ottawa and Rideau rivers. Sam Craig worked on a square timber drive down river to Montreal and has said to have taken the canoe along on the timber raft, then paddled it or rowed it back to up to Ottawa into the Rideau river and then eventually taken back to the farm near Vernon by wagon. down the Craster River for postcard. So uh, as you can see, it's a canoe on the Castor River. Uh, fo the photographic image is by Dan Roy Cameron. Yeah. Printed on a postcard entitled, yeah, down the river, down the Castor River. Um, the handwritten on an annotation on the front surface in ink below the image shows stating Mr. D. Cook. The image shows a canoe traveling on the Castor River, and of course, the, the Castor River binds together the Osgood town, the, the townships of Osgood and the adjacent Russell. It was donated by Joe Rowan of Metcalf, Ontario. So it's dated, postcard is dated January 22nd, which is written by the sender. We know it is 1906, date stamp from the postage mail. And it's addressed to Mr. J.E. Carson, Grand Rapids, Michigan. The written inscription says, we'll write you in a few days. Pa is not doing so well as usual. We are having delightful weather, almost look almost like summer every day from FJ, January 22nd. And you can see the, the accession number is written very in pencil. And of course the, uh, the one cent stamp is adhered to the postcard, which also gives an indication of its year, of its date. So the 1950s Farmar, Farm All Super A Red Tractor 
featured a four cylinder engine and electric pull start. This tractor was purchased by Amos Murdoch of Osgood from Modern Farm Supply, Ottawa in 1950. Purchased from Amos Murdoch by Tom and Manning McAvoy of Osgood in 1954. Donated to the museum on August 25th, 2001 by Joan and Manning McAvoy. And as you can see here, uh, the, here's the label that is included on the tractor that you can see inside the barn. So the 1907 Metcalf Hockey Club Champions photographic print. The photograph first entered the museum on loan by city councillor Doug Thompson on October 7th, 2003. Names of players and coaches listed directly on the photographic mounting paper. It's pretty interesting to note that the names of the hockey positions way back in 1907, where defense is noticeably missing, not really part of the game at that time. We know in the museum records that the original photograph was once housed in a frame and it was removed from the print in 2015. Eventually, the loan became permanent and the museum officially acquired the photograph into the collection when the donation paperwork was completed in October of 2010, which you can see here, signed by Councillor Doug Thompson. All right, so I have a uh, collections tour video that I'm just going to load up now and I'll, uh, I'll speak to what you're seeing. So this is my office area right there. You just saw my desk and the digitization station. And now we're gonna take you over to the photographic collection cabinet. So this is the cabinet that holds a lot of the photographs in the collection, the majority of them. And now you're going to see an acid-free envelope that is used to hold the photographs in. So it's safe to, safe to hold photographs. They're all alphabetized and we have them sometimes they're alphabetized by name or by category. So now we'll take you around our shelving systems and around the corner. And you will see just down the aisle here. You'll see a Coroplast box. So Coroplast is a safe to use material that we, we, we store artifacts in. and the tissue as well, and also foam that you will see, it's made from uh, polyethylene and it's safe to use around artifacts. And those are some CCM skates uh, bought at auction by Mrs. D. Porteous of Osgood. So it gives you an idea for uh, some of the areas that I work in every day. Well, I, almost every day. All right, so now we are going to uh, do, it's time for our activities. Um, and just give me a second here. Okay, there we go. So, so now it's time to get interactive with you. Please open an additional browser and you'll go to the website, join.nearpod.com. And then once you get to that main page, enter in the code 9JDV6. Sorry, I, I uh, skipped ahead of the slide. So I, I have it loaded up here. I will just await um, people to, to join in. And if, uh, yeah, if you need any assistance getting, getting in, then let us know. But I've seen, I've seen some people are coming in now. That's good. Okay, awesome. Okay, I see some more people coming through. That's great. Thank you. Oops. Trying to get this full screen. 
We got 13 participants. Does that any more? Okay, I'll just, I'll start the first activity. So, this first activity is a collaboration board. If you click on the text box, you can type in your answer to the question. What is a museum to you? How do you connect with the museums that you want to visit? And what do you want to see when you go there? So everything that you share and submit will be added to the board of ideas. Please take your time and write what most speaks to you. Awesome. A museum is a place that connects me to the past. So true. An amazing collection of history. Yeah. Museum in the, is the memory of a community. So true. These are great guys, thanks. Share community stories, learn about the past. Yeah. Museum is a collection of items to keep our history real. Yeah, awesome. Thanks so much, everybody, for your feedback. That's great. We got more coming through. Awesome. Yeah, these are awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks for their, your feedback and participation. I think we're good. We go to the next one. Yeah. All right. So this next activity we have for you is a matching exercise based on collections management. Click on the photo that you want to match with um, its corresponding title. The highlights the duties of someone who works in a collections, works in collections at a museum. I'm sorry if the uh, if the photographs weren't as obvious maybe as I thought they were, but good job everybody. Thanks for thanks for attempting. <laughs> Hope you liked that one. That was a bit more interactive than uh, just typing in some words. But for those of you that aren't uh, part of this, I think everybody's got in, or mostly. The first photograph is environmental monitoring. The second would be storage. The third one would be movement. The fourth one would be collections care. The fifth one would be photo documentation. And then the sixth one is exhibitions. Thanks, everybody. Great job with your matching skills. All right. So this open whiteboard activity on the life cycle of this horse collar. So if you click in that text box, you can share your thoughts there. Think about all the people who would have come into contact with this horse collar up until today. Who can we think of that would have played a role in its life? The maker, absolutely. Harness maker, for sure. And the, this horse collar is from 1850 to 1910. It was made in the shop of Timothy Ibsen in Metcalf, Ontario and it was donated by David Gray of Metcalf, Ontario. It's actually included in uh, zone two industry, wall mounted um, in the Osgood Township Museum's permanent exhibit. The family of the horse. Yeah, yeah, farmer. These are great, yeah, farmers, totally. Maker of the collar, the store. Yeah, these are awesome answers. Curator who acquired it for the museum, yeah. Any people petting the horse, yeah, for sure. Somebody just coming into contact with it, the donor. Awesome, thanks everybody. One more, we got one more for you and then, and then we'll go back to our presentation. So 
this one, same type of idea as before, as we previously did, but this time it's on the life cycle of this concrete block machine. It's a famous concrete block machine that was used to make local concrete products for many buildings in the area, in the local area. It became so popular that the concrete blocks were actually nicknamed Boyd blocks. And the Boyd brothers concrete still exists today. So this, this machine would have been used between 1902 and 1970. The operator, yeah, inventors. The Boyds, absolutely, bricklayers. Those who helped move it into the collection, yeah. Yeah, I, I can speak from experience myself. I, I moved that machine and it was heavy. It was very heavy. Architect, yeah, for sure. Architects need to know what kind of building materials they're working with. The owner of the building and structure. Yeah, these are great. Awesome, everybody. Thanks so much. Really appreciate that. All right, you, and I should mention too, that this, well, this photograph uh, is actually of the boy block machine in the exhibit. So this is, this, if you were to come and visit the exhibition and visit us at the museum, you would see this boy block machine. It's also in zone, zone two industry and it's on a plinth. All right, um, you guys, you all did awesome. Thank you so much for your participation. And uh, we'll go back into the slides, the presentation slides. So I just want to do a quick poll here, two quick polls, just on how the presentation went today. So information feedback poll, I'm going to launch it now. So just ask you how you found the information that was covered tonight. Awesome. Looks like it was a lot of Oh, no, it's balancing out a bit. I was just going to say, it looked like there was a lot of people that reported getting new information. That's, I'm happy to hear that. Somewhat review, yeah. That's great. Thanks, everybody. Any couple, a couple more? 84% voted, so I'm going to share that. Yeah, so it shows, you know, 43% of you said it was a lot of new information. That's wonderful. All right, one more poll, and then I'm going to open it up to questions from, from you guys. So this one is, how likely are you to attend a virtual talk or a museum event of this kind again? Thanks for your participation and feedback in the polls, everyone. It uh, will certainly be invaluable information for us moving forward. That's great, thank you. Much appreciated. And yeah, so good, good positive feedback. Thank you very much, everybody. All right, um, thank you for your time and attention tonight. We greatly appreciate you taking the time out of your Friday nights to spend with us. And I hope you enjoyed everything. And again, I thank you for your time. And now we do have, if we do have any questions or comments or queries, we will be opening up the discussion to you. So thank you, merci and miigwech. Thanks, Patrick. I, uh, we've got a few questions coming in the chat here. So I've got some to pose to you. So our first one comes from Beverly. Thanks for the question, Beverly. She said, what would you consider the most valuable piece in the museum's collection? Which I think is a really interesting question because, um, you know, as a museum worker, I automatically looked at that from a provenance uh, perspective. So maybe you could uh, share your input in that. Absolutely. It's a really good question. Um, I, I, I would, uh, I think I would just defer to some of my personal favorite uh, artifacts in the collection. And for me, it's, I, I'm biased because I really like, like uh, hockey and anything to do with Larry Robinson. 
Uh, so that could be that sweater that that was autographed or that his jersey that uh, was signed by him or uh, the the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the hockey stick that's on display in the permanent exhibit uh, that was used by Larry in the 1976 All-Star game as well. So I, I, for me, I, I'm just, I love hockey. So I would, I would refer to something to do with, a lo with our local legend, Larry Robinson. Do you have anything to add, Jill? Yeah, I'm just thinking of like um, an artifact that really speaks to our community. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the favorite ones from our community members perspective would have to be our stone and stump puller, which is a fairly rare piece of equipment. Um, it's a stored in our agricultural barn and it's a large piece of equipment, probably about, probably about 15 feet high and about 20 feet long. Um, and it would have been used to pull out large stumps and stones from the fields prior to planting. Um, and I just, it's always so exciting to see people's faces when they come across this, this stone and stump puller because it's something you definitely don't see anymore. So they really make that connection to how um, agriculture has advanced um, and, you know, and farm machinery has advanced in the past hundred years. That, that would be one of my favorite ones. Um, you know, and, and talking to um, like the value of items. Um, I mean, we're, we're authorized as a museum to appraise items under the value of $1,000 and from there on out they're appraised out of house. But I really don't um, look at it from a money perspective. I definitely look at it from, um, you know, its provenance and its history, how it was used, how it was made and uh, how we can have those connections to the past. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the questions. I'll, I'll pose another one to you, Patrick. Um, if I can find it here. Um, Adam had a question. Uh, yeah, Adam had a question for you. And he said, um, what one of your favorite things to do as a museum uh, worker, aside from talking to us tonight? <laughs> aside from, sorry. Right. Aside from talking to us tonight. Oh, that's a great question. Um, thanks, thanks for the question. I, I just, I, I, I just love being able to go down certain rabbit holes that uh, that are that exist in the collection. And if I come across a, a photo or or something that's just so compelling to me, uh, it just has a big impact on me. And I, I share that with my family a lot. Like if I come across something that's really interesting or is just a really cool photo or just a cool artifact or an object, I tend to like to snap a photo of it and send it with, send it to my family so that they can see that and live through, live through my photographs, I guess, in a way, but uh, they're always telling me I have a really cool job and I, you know, I, I just, I feel very thankful and grateful to work in this field because it's a privilege to, to work in this field. And I don't take that for granted. I certainly, um, you know, appreciate every day that I get to work in, in a collection and work with museum objects. Thanks, Patrick. So Daniel has a question. Um, how long on average is the typical life cycle of an artifact? And what are the most common reasons to be deaccessioned? I always thought that museums kept most items and continuously getting get bigger over time as they collect more and more objects. So I think that's a that's a really great question. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so so I mean I, I went over some of the uh, conditions that would warrant a deaccession. And like, you know, it can be from, from anything that the, the object is just in poor condition, just we can't, we can't care for it anymore. We can't interpret it in any way. Um, it's, just, it's just decomposed so much that you know, we can't really do much with it at that point. So um, that would potentially warrant deaccessioning. Another one would be uh, you know, it doesn't have any connection to the collections policies or the mandate. Uh, we just don't know, doesn't have any documented information on it. So that would warrant a deaccession potentially. If you have duplications in the, in the collection, if you have the same object and you have like 20 of them, 
you don't necessarily need to keep all of them. So uh, that would that could potentially warrant a deaccession as well. And then, um, oh my gosh, what was the other part of this question? <laughs> Sorry. I, oh, I, I have it in the chat. I'm looking back. Okay, what okay. are the most reasons? Yeah, and yeah. a typical life How long cycle on average? Yeah. Ooh, that's that's it's hard to say because it really depends on the material composition of of each object. So, like you know, it depends on on the condition that you get it in initially, maybe, or what the what the object is composed of. So it really depends. It's hard to give an average. I I don't know. I I couldn't. I unless Jill, you want to throw out a number. <laughs> I I don't know if I could put a numerical no. number on that. Yeah. <laughs> I would say it totally is dependent on the condition in which it arrives to the museum. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's condition in general, if it's something that's really sensitive to fluctuations in temperature and relative humidity, if that um, kind of, you know, has an impact on its condition, um, deterioration, that kind of thing. So yeah, it's totally dependent on, on what it is and its condition. For sure. And I was just going to speak to his last point too, I always thought that museums kept most items and continuously get bigger over time. And that's, you know, I would say that that's the practices of the past, that they would just actively collect everything and anything that they possibly could get their hands on essentially. And that's an active way of collecting. We are more of an, I would just call it, I would term it more of a passive way of collecting. We assess everything so much more now than they did in the past. They would maybe take it in and accession it and then realize what they have. Whereas now it's a much more methodical process where we understand what we're exactly what we're bringing in and we justify it too. So that we plan, you know, we're going to have this exhibit. Okay. So maybe this object could be part of this exhibit. And this is the reason why we want to accession it. So that would uh, certainly be a part of it as well. Yeah. So there's a couple of questions coming in that are related to um, Daniel's question. And thank you, Daniel, again, for that question. Um, so Jerry, um, who's with the Chesterville District Historical Society, thanks for joining us, Jerry. Um, he asks, um, if an object is not for your museum, how do you look for an alternate home? That's a really good question. So we would um, reach out to other institutions that are either in the area or you know what may be the most suitable place for that object to go to it always comes back to the the life cycle information so what do we know about that object if you know maybe where the donor lived if it was if there's a museum around that area then that maybe would be the most appropriate place for that object to go to if it's a it's, if there's a museum there um but yeah it's uh yeah, that, do you have anything else to add, Jill? I think that's uh... yeah, that answers it. Like, um, there are a lot of resources online to um, to refer to when you're putting together collections policies and procedures that can help you um, determine, you know, that that series um, in which you go through um, if an item doesn't meet your mandate. Um, yeah, that's stuff that we can send along to you if you'd like. Um, we're happy to share what we have. Um, that's all part of being community museums. We're happy to support our other museums in the area too. Um, another question, uh, thanks Barry for that question. Another question kind of related is it, it's twofold. Um, so um, are there any donor accountability practices you need to follow, i.e. annual report to donors or does it depend on the donor request and or amount of donation? Uh, it's a good question. Are there any donor accountability practices you need to follow? Annual reports. Yeah, so maybe I can answer to the annual mm -hmm. reports uh, part of this question. Um, because we are um, a community operated museum and like Patrick mentioned, um, you know, it's a public institution. So we're accountable to the public. We um, are share our annual reports every year to the public. And um, it normally lists, um, you know, our, our cash flow for the end of year as a, according to our audited financial statements. Um, and then we also list our partners, our contributors, 
um, and our volunteers. So it doesn't really get into details about um, donors in terms of donating uh, objects, but more so from a monetary side of things. But um, maybe Patrick, if you can talk a bit about maybe the deeds of gifts and how that, how that, maybe that might help answer Dan's question. Yeah, I mean, the, the deed of gift is really like the documentation paperwork that officially like transfers ownership from the donor to the museum. Um, accountability practices, I mean, we would be in contact with the donor following an acquisition. So like we would either send them a thank you letter or some kind of follow up to, to be accountable for what we took from them and like be, of course, be super grateful for that because every time we get a potential donation we we certainly have to we have to you know be thoughtful about it and and be sympathetic uh, we have, oh yeah i don't i would just not sympathetic but we have to be careful in how we um correspond with donors too because they're they're protective sometimes you know they're they're donating something that was in their family for a long time or like belong to their parents or something. So there's a lot of sentimental value that can go in there. So it can be, sometimes it can be delicate. Um, so you have to certainly be thoughtful in what, in how you approach certain things. And um, sometimes having a, having a conversation on the phone or in person can go a long way too. for that. I just have to find it again. Uh, we have some great questions. I appreciate all of these that are That's coming in. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. So Benoit has a question. Um, I answered it very briefly, but, um, but do you have, uh, or sorry, do you do additional research on donated items or do you take the donor's word for the history of the object? Is there anything you wouldn't accept as a donation? So two questions in that. Um, so we certainly would try to do additional research on donated items. I mean, for our, for the museum's own records, I think that, uh, you know, you want to be, you want to be sure of what you're, you're reporting to, to the public. So, you, you know, taking the donor's word is, is certainly something that like it, it does, it does have some kind of sway, and I, I like because oral history is such a big thing too that we want to to document. So, and like you know, it, in essence, history can be interpreted in different ways. It's an open to interpretation. So, um, you know, so I would say that uh, you certainly take the donor's word and you document that and you you keep that as part of the catalog record. But then you also at the same time. Do your own research and and kind of confirm what you can within your own collection because you can maybe look at something else that's related to that item if it came from the same area or the same family because a lot of this a lot of the times too there there are big accessions that come that have the source or sourced from the same people so do some research in that area as well to try and find some correlation is there anything that you wouldn't accept as a donation uh, we wouldn't accept any donation with conditions. So if a donor wanted to put specific conditions on something, on a donation that they were saying, oh, you know, I, I want this out on display right away and it has to be out on display right away, we, we wouldn't be able to commit to that agreement because, you know, it, we just, we, we have to plan accordingly as we do, you know, uh, for our strategic plans and everything, but uh, certainly, like we, we can't take any donation with conditions. That's just that's just kind of standard across the board for all museums. And Patrick, you mentioned briefly too. Um, um, you know, items that don't fall within our mandate; those are items that we also wouldn't collect. Right. Right. Thanks, Joe. No problem. So we have um, a couple more questions here. I'm going to take up um, so much time being cognizant of everyone's time this evening. And then we appreciate um, all of your questions, all of your feedback. Uh, one comment that we had from Dawn is that lots of artifacts that are not on display and that 
that's uh, very true. It's probably um, not a very well-known fact like um, in the public, but um, um, yeah, there's it's something like 1% of a museum's collection is on display where the rest is in store. It's around 1% or so, obviously, depending on the institution. But I think we're fortunate um, as a as a larger site with the main building and the agricultural barn that we get to display a bit more, but um, that is certainly a truth to that. Um, I have another question. In, let's see, we have another comment um, from Rayanne. I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. Uh, as someone who works in heritage, just wanted to comment. I appreciate how you presented all the information and talks like this helps to demystify what happens behind the scenes at museums. Great, thank you. Yeah, we re I really appreciate that comment. Thanks for that. Thanks for that feedback. Because that's what we were attempting to do is to try and pull back the curtain, if you will, and show people what how we operate and some of the processes that we want to follow. And um, yeah, so thank you. <laughs> appreciate yeah. that. So trying, trying to make it more of a transparent operation because really we were wanting to share. Um, our work experiences with others and uh, you know um, increasing the public's knowledge on how museums operate. So Tina has a question here. Um, what are some of the oldest items in the museum's collection approximately how uh, old are they? Uh, so I would I would reference the 1827 land deed that we that I that I showed a photograph of previously. Um, I wouldn't say that's probably, I would say some of those land deeds are some of the oldest items that we have in the collection. So like we're talking like early 1800s ish. Um, so around that era, uh, certainly around, it would have been after the war of 1812. Um, so, you know, when, when soldiers were coming back after they fought in the war, they were actually given uh, land because for their service and, uh, and yeah, that would be, you know, right when the museum, right when the township was first getting started, really. So uh, th that's some of the oldest items that we have. And just to add to that point, um, you know, although we are um, the Aussie Township Museum, uh, our hope is to expand our time frame beyond uh, 1800 to 2001. So um, when you asked that question, the first thing that came to my mind were our, um, the Indigenous items in the collection. Right. Um, we have uh, pro projectile points and work stones, and they range to the late um, archaic period. So they're about, the oldest would be about uh, 6,500 years before Common Era, so about 1950s. So those are some old artifacts, absolutely. A little bit older than 1800s. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jill. <laughs> Um, I think that I've seen all of the questions I missed in the chat, but uh, one last comment from Laura saying, um, I have worked um, before in a community operated museum. It's really an incredible thing being able to be part of what makes a museum a museum. Thank you, Patrick, for your work with the Oscar Museum and everyone involved. Great, thank you, Laura. That's thank great. you, Laura. That's a very nice comment. Thank you. Of course, or um, if you'd like to reach out to us, uh, Patrick has his email address there. We'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Yeah, I'd be I'd be happy to get back to everybody on some of these other questions that we weren't able to get to tonight because I think we're like uh, just going out about an hour and a half. So I think uh, uh, I think that's time to time to and tonight's talk. So thanks again to everybody for, for spending time your Friday nights with us. We really do appreciate it. And um, look out for the, the next museum talk. It's gonna be in April and uh, it's, uh, it's on an Arctic exploration adventure. So it should be pretty interesting. All right. Um, Jill, I, if you don't have anything else to add, I think that we will say goodnight. Great. Thank you so much, Patrick. And thanks to everyone for 
um, checking out our, our first in the series of museum talks. Thank you very much, everybody. It was a, it was a pleasure. Take care and stay safe and healthy, everybody. Take care.